The doctrine of the atonement lies at the very heart of Christian faith. But how does it work? Various theories have been advanced over the years, and they all make good points. But none take into account much the social world of the New Testament, how the people of that world might have understood the doctrine. To the end of resolving that, I came up with the Patronage Transference Model, or PTM. PTM does take some things for granted, such as that God exists and is our judge, and that Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. So, funny atheist, before you whine in that I'm begging the question that all that happened, sit down. This ain't the place for it. PTM also assumes that the social world of the New Testament was rooted in the concepts of honor and shame. Many theories of atonement, and many criticisms of the doctrine, assume the world of the Bible was like ours, a culture of guilt, and to that extent they criticize a false view. In light of the honor and shame orientation of the biblical world, there are several steps in presenting PTM. First, God is in the position of highest authority, of the highest good, and is therefore a being of the highest personal honor. Second, all sin and evil are an insult to the honor of God, a disregard of his rule and authority and an honor offense. Any who commit sin or evil, therefore, are degrading God's honor and status, because this honor rightly belongs to God, and it must be restored. Hey, wait a minute! <laughs> yes, this had better be about the atonement and not off-topic. Yeah, yeah, look, you can't take honor away from God. He's all-powerful. Your theory sucks, man. Yeah, this is exactly the sort of asinine commentary you get from fundy atheists whose knowledge of the social world of the Bible comes off of cereal boxes. Sit down. Anyway, that argument fails because ancient people recognized two types of honor. Acquired honor, and what we might call inherent honor. Inherent honor is honor due someone because of what they are by nature. Their family associations, for example. This type of honor is associated with God's nature. And yes, that can't be taken away. But acquired honor is a different matter. It has to do with one's deeds and authority. This kind of honor, even if it belongs to God, can be taken away, because at its core is what others, including us, think of God. God being omnipotent won't change that. Step 3. God's proper response to disobedience, which dishonors him, is to require the shaming of those who degrade his honor. Step 4. Jesus Christ underwent the crucifixion, which was what anthropologists call a status degradation ritual, and he did this in our place. In other words, he experienced the shame that was rightly owed to us. Step 5. This act of Jesus allows him to be a broker of God's mercy and favor. God the Father acts as a patron or powerful benefactor, and we are situated as clients. Now let's explain those two terms briefly because I know some of you fundy atheists out there are reaching for some kind of dictionary, which will show you that the words client and patron are synonyms. So yeah, sit down. When we use the terms client and patron here, we're talking about a very typical sort of relationship between people in this kind of social setting. And similar systems can be found in many other cultures around the world even today. A patron is a person with a lot of wealth or power who enlists less wealthy or powerful people as, you might say, employees or clients. In between the two people are what we call brokers, persons who negotiate the terms of the contract between client and patron and manage the relationship. To sum it up, God the Father, patron. All of us, clients. Jesus, and also the Holy Spirit, in other respects, are the brokers. That's what a New Testament era person would have understood. So now more specifically, how would this relationship have worked out, and why would anyone sign up to be a client of God the Father? In this case, the need for us to approach the patron, the Father, is dictated by the fact that we have offended him by our sin. In the process of crucifixion, Jesus acts as a broker for those who wish to enter into a covenant with God. You might then say that Jesus does a sort of currency exchange, in which our pledge of loyalty is transacted through him into currency that the Father accepts as payment for sin. We become part of the body of Christ and share in Christ's virtual identity, and so his payment for sin in essence becomes ours. So that's PTM in a nutshell. There's more to this involving what role our works play in the whole thing, and I'll just sum up by saying that yes, it remains the same that works don't save you, though you can get rewards for them. That just leaves some objections we might get, but we'll deal with those in part two. So yes, sit down.